This is Monica Perez here with a, a special guest who's popping on to do a special report at uh, in the moment. I asked our you know podcasting uh, cohort and previous guest Pasta if he could clue us in on Haiti, and he said, "Not me. I know the guy." <laughs> and this is the guy, Professor Danny Shaw. He is a professor of Latin American and Caribbean studies at CUNY, which is the City University of New York. He's also an adjunct professor, lecturer at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York, and does a lot of other things, speaks, uh, writes, and coaches on boxing, nutrition, and actually uh, something in your profile rings a bell for me. You were in the Golden Gloves and fought at Madison Square Garden as a heavyweight. And my brother did that too. But unlike you, he is not a sober coach and is no longer with us. But oh, I'm sorry. He, he had a well, he he lived hard, let's just say. But in any case, uh, I remember seeing him fight in the golden gloves at Madison Square Garden like in the 70s. I hate to date myself, but um anyway, so you have quite an interesting, broad and deep resume. Thank you so much for being here. And you're an expert in many, many areas. But today I wanted to hear about Haiti. So how are you? Thank you for coming. Yes, us boxers train hard and um, go hard in, in, in life. That's a theme. Uh, sorry to hear about your brother. Sounds like a legendary figure. Um, I returned from Haiti uh, last month. Um, things have really, yeah, been intense. And how unfortunate that it took this um, ridiculous, sensationalistic, racist headline about 48 hours ago about cannibalism among one of the gang leaders. It's just, it's just ridiculous. And I never got phone calls from so many continents and countries in, in one day. Uh, Haiti became the lead story. And that's consistent with the informational war on Haiti. We only hear about Haiti when it's chaos, when it's coups when it's a kidnapped president, when it's a disease. It, this whole charge of cannibalism reminded me of the 1980s. The Department of Health put out the infamous 4-H study saying that the four groups responsible for carrying the AIDS virus were hemophiliacs, homosexuals, heroin users, and Haitians. And the Haitian community, I know. It's, it's, you know, it's I knew, I'm from New York. Um, originally from Brooklyn, but I grew up in Rockland County and I lit, worked in the restaurant business like I was a waitress for many years in the 80s. And in the kitchen, just about everybody was Haitian. And in the church we went to in Spring Valley, New York, uh, just about everybody was Haitian. And I just, the, I know they get terrible press. I know it's a, an impoverished country. And when I saw the coup that happened right after Biden took office, it seemed it had U.S. fingerprints all over it. And I just was reminded of the at least century of abuse that that country has received from a lot of different fronts. But I mean, I even think back of Bush and Clinton both showed up there at the same time. Like, you know, you're in trouble when both of those guys are showing up. So, yeah, I think I feel like they they've just and it's been one of the poorest countries in the world for a very long time. Yeah. In, interesting. Interesting that you mentioned uh, Spring Valley. Spring Valley is definitely one of the Haitian, uh, the epicenters of Haitian migration. It's southern Florida, number one. And then it's probably East Flatbush, Brooklyn. Uh, Boston's up there, but but Spring Valley is probably fourth or fifth. So very interesting. Yeah, definitely when they put the Bush Clinton tag team together, um, not for Haiti, but against Haiti with the earthquake uh, donations in 2010, we knew it was going to be uh, the next phase of this uh, colonial treatment of, of, of Haiti. And sure enough, the Haitian people continue to ask, where are the billions and billions of dollars? It's a figure of some $14 billion that was donated by the quote unquote international community. One billion came from the United States. And um, so little was actually done to, to, to rebuild for Haiti. 90% of that money was disappeared in the bureaucracies of the Red Cross and the, in, in the UN. So I think where to begin, you know, the most common word we hear in the press are gangs. Gangs have taken over Port-au-Prince. These are not gangs. These are paramilitaries. These are mercenaries. These are death squads. 
And what I did, I was documenting the people's resistance on the barricades on the front lines because the people are forced to um, defend themselves. Um, there's very few active um, police agents. Historically, the Haitian National Police have been the agents of repression. In the 2021 rebellion before Jovenel Moise was assassinated by Colombian paramilitaries and by the Based whole in Miami. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. The the private security firms in Miami, owned by a Colombian uh, American citizen, connections to the DEA and to U.S. intelligence, and twenty three Colombian paramilitaries in, in the middle of of Haiti. And in 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 a little anecdote, you know, with the prison break, must have been um, about a week ago now. They also broke out those Colombians, uh, about 4,000 plus. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, listen to the punchline. So don't get excited yet. So well, that, the- I mean, that's pretty uh, telling. <laughs> well, so 4,000 prisoners are, are, are broken out. It's the paramilitaries that organize this. They want to show their strength versus the lack of strength of the Haitian state. I wouldn't say a failed state. I'd say a successful colonial state. And um, you had petty criminals and thieves, quote unquote thieves, you know, the prisoner, uh, uh, economic prisoners locked up for robbing or who knows what, who never saw a judge in four, five, six years. So thank goodness those innocent individuals were able to flee. You also had hardened gangsters and hardened rapists and murderers and the people who come from the ranks of these mercenaries, they also escaped the Haitian National Penitentiary. Um, but when they stumbled upon the Colombians, the Colombians said, no, no, you know, we're going to stay right here. <laughs> so the Colombians stayed there because they knew that if they left, people were going to remember. Because the Haitian people had a whole popular movement of millions against Jovenel Moise, against the prior dictator, the prior U.S. lackey. There's been three installations of U.S. power through this political party called the PHTK. That acronym would translate as the Haitian bald-headed party because their original um, lackey, his name was Michel Martelly. And well, let's just say he had a haircut, you know, <laughs> like similar <you>. to mine. <laughs> I, I used to compare myself to a Haitian dictator like Michel Martelly. And it's the gangsterization of the country started under him in 2010, in 2011, It was a power crisis. So Hillary Clinton, who else, flies down in the name of the State Department. She's the Secretary of State, and she benights uh, Michel Martelly. He becomes the next president. Very little popular support. You know, participatory democracy in Haiti has been missing since 2001, when Jean-Bertrand Aristide was voted into office. He was the people's candidate. He represented the ghettos from, from below. He campaigned on a slogan of um, from abject misery to dignified poverty, such a humble slogan, right? And and, and, and the colonizers of yesteryear and the colonizers of today refused to um, even allow that. So there were two coups against Haiti. And this is in 1991 coup, 2004 coup, U.S. Marines involved both times under Clinton, then under Bush, Tweedledee, Tweedledum, Democrat, Republican, same imperial policy, whether it's against Palestine or Bolivia, or aggression against China, aggression against Haiti and Nicaragua and all the way down the line. And what the Haitians say every day is that they want to have strong diplomatic and commercial relations uh, with the Mexicans and with the Venezuelans and with the Bolivarian camp, and they don't want to be invaded again by the Brazilians. And very shamefully, you know, and that's where I met Pasta. Pasta and I were covering the Brazilian uh, elections about a year and a half ago. Um, and really, the biggest um, spot on Lula's uh, record, he uh, was a part of this core group, Brazil still is. And they uh, spearheaded, along with the U.S., France, Canada, the neo-colonial partners, uh, Brazil was the one that supplied the troops, troops who had occupied the favelas, Rocinha, Fazenginha. So they took their expert uh, counterinsurgency training from the favelas of Brazil and then uh, went into Haiti as, 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 as occupiers. They called it the stabilization, the U.N. stabilization mission. The acronym was MINUSTA. But the Haitians saw it as um, 
a mission of humiliation, a mission of destabilization. So this is all the context that begins to explain today who's taken power in the ghettos of Port-au-Prince, a city of 2.5 million, similar population to Gaza. Uh, one fifth of Port-au-Prince is now without their homes. They've been burned out of their homes by these uh, death squads. And that's what I've been uh, documenting. Let's at least share an image or two um, just to take people uh, into, into Haiti. Uh, this is me here documenting uh, some of the uh, barricades and this is no man's land uh, behind me. Some of these, um, this this was like the front lines of where um, where uh, the the these gangs are uh, are attacking. These here are these are community mobilizations. These are community mobile. We can get a uh, sound. <laughs> Community mobilizations with the masses of people. This is where I was staying. Everyone check out Molegaf. Molegaf are the Black Panthers of Haiti. This is one of the important grassroots organizations. So you have massive community mobilizations against the death squads. The problem is that the people are uh, outgunned. So the research that I've been doing is, well, Haiti doesn't produce guns. The Dominican Republic doesn't produce guns. But... <laughs> There's this huge mystery. How are there almost 1 million illegal guns in Haiti? Well, voila, the U.S.'s gun crisis is also the neocolonies' gun crisis. Are they banned? Are guns banned in Haiti for the, for the population? Um, in Mexico, there are a lot of gun deaths, but I believe there's an actual gun ban in Mexico. So, yeah. it, so I'm just wondering only because maybe you know they put those laws in so the people cannot rebel. Yeah, I never even thought about it, it actually, you know, because because there's such impunity. Whether a law is in place, it would be paper law anyway. Right. So I never even thought to actually well, pose that question. Let me ask. So you said Moise was a plant. He's a U.S. guy. And then he was taken out, though, also by the U.S. Is that correct? Certainly. You know, there's a brand new book that just dropped. I have a book review coming out in NACLA, the North American Congress of Latin America, uh, tomorrow. Um, I should have grabbed the book. It's in my, uh, my, my living room. It's called The AIDS State, and it's by Jake Johnson, a researcher and author who's at the um, Center for Economic and Policy Research. He's the true, true expert on the dynamics of the July 7th, 2000. Uh, 21 assassination of Jovenel Moise. I've looked at the headlines. I've read, you know, was Martin Moise somehow involved? His wife, you know, a lot of times these are such these are such distracting, sensationalistic uh, headlines. I work within the Dominican media, and they had a bunch of questions on it. I didn't see anything that looked to me terribly uh, valid, but it's like they want to just throw everybody in that. Yeah, game. I can't believe. He was a part of that. She was she was shot herself. It was super yeah. duper though. Not like you know, she was super messed up. And he was ready for. I think he was aware that they were coming for him. I mm -hmm. doubt you know. Well, I don't know, but I found it hard to believe when they were they're out to get her and she's in hiding. I don't know if that's still the case. And I just figure, well, they're trying to get her because she probably knows stuff. Yeah, and and there was a key detail there, and I think it speaks to the internalized colonial complex of many Haitians, the Haitian bourgeoisie, the Haitian oligarchs, when the Colombian paramilitaries and their American and in, in, informants and in guides, when they charge on Jovenel's um, mansion, his complex, they yell in English, D-E-A, D-E-A. And <laughs> the entire presidential guard throws down their guns and jumps down on their stomachs and puts their hands up. So it's amazing. As soon as they heard English, wow, those, those colonial we, that that colonized. Wow, fear. yeah, because well, it's hopeless then at that point. You know, it's hopeless. You're not, you do not have a fighting chance with the whole uh, Western world coming at you. So how did so Henry? I was confused by the succession after Moise. Like, it's impossible to figure this stuff out just reading the newspaper that we get, like you're saying, like you can't figure out about Moise, but I've heard you say that Henri was like put in place by us. He was our choice. And you would think that he'd have been more successful if he had that force behind him. I just found it impossible to sort through. 
Haiti, you know, as Jamima Pierre, uh, Dr. Pierre from the Black Alliance for Peace, she was on Democracy Now! And what she was explaining was um, Haiti is the colonial laboratory of the United States. They're trying to use the Global Fragility Act to justify a longer occupation of Haiti. If we go back the last um, three, four decades, uh, Haiti has been occupied by U.S. troops and foreign troops for the bulk of those years. Of course, there was the 1915 to 1934 U.S. military occupation of Haiti. So Haiti fits every definition of the neo-colony. And, and the Haitians are asking, is it 2024 or is it 1492? <laughs> is it 1620? You know, how, 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 one of the most common slogans in Haiti is, um, c'est grand moun tête nouye. We are adults. We can decide for ourselves. Why do, does a sovereign people have to assert in 2024 that they're adults <laughs> and they don't need U.S. Pater paternalism to decide their future? Deadly paternalism. And it's not like they could ever really, they can't not possibly be a threat to us. Like they don't have weapons. They're in our sphere, but they we have no justification for invading. And that's why I felt like there was so much press for a while there of Haitians coming across the Mexican border. It's like, well, they do that so that you have a reason that American people will say, well, it's our problem now, so we have to fix it. But of course, that stuff is all totally manufactured. And that's why Ron DeSantis was on the front page of CNN and Fox and every newspaper today saying that the Haitian migrants are going to represent, are going to, you know, so they're, they're preparing yeah. everything. It, the, it's an informational, the war on Haiti, first and foremost, is an informational war. And the ideas that I'm sharing, this is just my training since since 1998, working with the Haitian left, working with the anti-imperialist grassroots forces, I you know we got to talk about barbecue and we got to talk about uh, previous you know invasions, and I'm just translating uh, so much of what they have uh, mm -hmm. of of taught me. Uh, they have uh, taught me. I've been studying Creole since um, 1998. It's a very anti-colonial language. It's a language filled of uh, Haitian resistance and Haitian ancestry. There's been an all-out assault on Haitian spirituality. Really, no surprise. But you know, voodoo is not a, a negative thing. It's Afro-Haitian spirituality. It's in the music. Like you all just saw voodoo. That little clip from the march. You heard the music. They're playing their own voodoo music. But when we hear voodoo in the U.S. through <laughs> Hollywood and it's all this negativity. I have to so as soon as I heard the cannibalism headline, I was like, oh yeah. man. I really hadn't heard that. I did not reach out for that reason. I had talk not show, heard that. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm not. I know. You're, you're a conscious <laughs> I, uh, talk show host. <laughs> but <laughs> I hadn't read that. But yeah, the, the voodoo, I know. Um, I was watching some TV show once and the Haitians were, it was like, it was a drama, but it was, they were, looked like they were doing voodoo and they were singing. And my daughter, young daughter in grammar school, she was in Catholic school, started singing the song they were singing. And I said, well, how would you know that song? And she said, well, it's just the Hail Mary in French. So it's like a syncretic religion. It's like two different, it's, you know, it's got a lot of Catholic and Christian influence, you know, their spirituality. And though I actually only knew the patients because we went to the church in Spring Valley, the Catholic church where they all went. Sometimes oh, yeah. we'd even go to the mass in French, even though we don't speak French, it still counts. But oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Haiti, Haiti is an extremely, uh, Haiti is an extremely, uh, extremely Catholic uh, country, but you have the fusion with, with the voodoo, so it is possible mm -hmm. to fuse these two different yeah. spiritualities, and and that plays out across Haiti, though. Catholic Haitians, if you mention voodoo, they're basically going to regurgitate everything you would expect from Christians. Against oh, the they hate it? Okay. I oh, didn't know that. Sure. I mean, I oh, never, sure. I wasn't really witness to any of the voodoo stuff, but I did know they were very religious. The people I worked with, the people we went to church with were extremely spiritual and religious from a Catholic perspective in any case. So as a, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm the voodoo... Uh, wave sweeping the U.S. is not, not consistent with my experience from Haitian immigrants. No, 100%. I mean, the French arrived, as the old saying goes, from Desmond Tutu in South Africa. The French arrived with a gun in one hand and a Bible in the other. And then there's the famous uh, quote where they say, 
the colonizer arrived and, and he told the colonized, you know, close your eyes. And when the colonized opened up their eyes, the land was gone, but they then had a Bible. So this. Well, uh, I will say the opiate of the masses thing. I do worry about that a little bit because I get so hopeless in the world today, reading the news, following the news. And then I just think, you know, I just have faith in God. And then I'm, I, you know, I always think I'm like, oh, you know, that is a good way to get people to accept you know, to accept what's happening, but I still do it. I, I I'm Hold a spiritual, you know, I'm a God fearing spiritual man myself. So this is not casting aspersions on anyone's right, spiritual. Right. I pray, I'm Good. a praying man Got myself. Right. But um, in Haiti, I can't tell you how many times because as an ethnographer, as a sociologist, as a guest staying in different homes, of course, I was in all types of they call it peristil, that's like the voodoo temples. Then, of course, I was in the Catholic cathedrals and really um, evangelical religion is growing, you know, immensely. And I remember the Catholic preachers and the evangelical preachers saying, if you need a job, if you need more money, if you're trying to travel to see your family, you know, where? Well, of course, in Miami or New York, <laughs> you know, come and pray more. So I, I think that, you know, Marxian axiom of uh, <laughs> religion is the opium of the masses. And that's why they shut down Jean Bertrand Aristide, because he was a proponent of liberation theology, of using the church to build consciousness. Both coups in Haiti were coups against the legacy of liberation theology. They called it the Tile Eglise, the church of the people, of, of the people, you know, the, the humble, of, of Amba, the people below. So, yeah, there's, there's really a war for, for, for Haiti's soul as well mm -hmm. in, 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 in spiritual terms. So, well, the question of Jimmy Cherizier of barbecue, that's been a main headline uh, in the world. Um the Haitian people say that he's another thug, he's another gangster. The, the word I heard the most since 2021, this is something that I've been looking at three years be, for three years because February 7th, 2021, there's a massive uh, insurrection because first it's Michel Martelly. Haitian people were extremely frustrated with him. With him. They had Bayi Locke. Uh, that uh, locking down the entire country, blockades, people's popular barricades against Michel Martelly, then against Jovenel Moise. You have the uh, Petro Caribbean scandal. Uh, Venezuela sent some $6.6 .6 billion in uh, Petro internationalism, uh, oil solidarity, oil diplomacy from Hugo Chavez and the Bolivarian Revolution. All of that money disappears. The, 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 the bureaucrats, the sycophants of Michel Martelly, of the PHTK, Jovenel Moise. So there's this whole movement against Jovenel Moise of hundreds of thousands. I marched alongside hundreds of, 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 of thousands. Um, but no Haitian wanted to murder. I mean, right. they, they may have said vitriolic words. We all yeah. use vitriolic words. But, but all of a sudden he's murdered. But that took... Again, the decision yeah. out of the hands of the Haitian people, because after that, there was a carte blanche that no one could march anymore. There was martial law. There were curfews. So the entire movement, and I was on, I think it was the second to last flight out of Haiti when he was uh, uh, murdered. So I, I had just left. Um, and then Ariel Henry is put into power. And Monica, you spoke to it as quick as the colonizer. Walter Rodney said that the colonizer is a one-armed bandit. And if people haven't studied Dr. Walter Rodney, how Europe underdeveloped Africa, one of the great anti-colonial scholars of generations past. And he said, um, using that colonialism as a one-armed bandit. So as quick as they, 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 they impose Ariel Henry, they decided last week, they called up Ariel Henry, according to the Miami Herald. He's almost landing in Port-au-Prince. Mm -hmm. They reroute his plane. The mm -hmm. Dominicans say you can't land here. And Anthony Blinken and the State Department say, <laughs> well, you're no longer the prime minister. <laughs> so we really have to ask yeah, yeah. the people of the United States, for how long? I can't say we because I've never appointed or imposed any president or dictator on any other country. So I can't say us. I don't right. think you have either, Monica. Yeah. I don't suspect so. <laughs> but for how long can the United States dictate who the leadership should be of Nicaragua, of China, of Russia, of Zimbabwe, of, of Vietnam? It's it's preposterous. For as long as we pay for the weapons. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, speaking of which, I'll just show you the uh, 
the, some of my latest uh, research here, guns, gangs, and neo-colonialism, hundreds of thousands of guns made in the United States propel a gang war that has turned Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince, into a war zone. This is the organization that I work with. Uh, clearly, Molegaf stands for the Movement for Equality and Liberation for All Haitians. This is Dominique Ressin. This is an incredible popular leader. He, he survived at least um, three uh, assassination attempts that I've documented. Here we're meeting, this is actually from that people's church. This, this, uh, this organization was an organization of, uh, of young men and women. The, the women aren't in the picture. Um, but this was in the north of, uh, of Haiti. Caribbean blood, U.S. sharks. Um, a Smuggler's Paradise. Ah, this is Chedensky Jean-Baptiste. He was assassinated last year. Oh. This is another Haitian revolutionary. I'm writing a tribute. This is Tedina, another incredible revolutionary. And and that's that, that's the lie that probably hurts me the most. And that's why I try to do this um this work. I mean, I've never received dissent for it. It's all all out of love. You'll never make a living as an anti-imperialist <laughs> in, in case anyone thought, you know. I'm sure of that. <laughs> See, but I have a question for you about these people, the leaders from the grassroots leaders are, Haiti has been in such a mess for so long. It's, it's institutions and population, everything have been undermined the way you're saying, like Africa is deliberately underdeveloped. If, if they were to actually uh, rise to power, if somehow they could chase out the Americans and all that that means. I mean, could one of those guys just slide in and run the country or would it be doomed to failure already? Like, you know, what would it take to actually make it a functioning place yes, run so, by the people? Oh, oh, hundred percent. I mean, it, it's really so simple in a sense, yet so difficult. Uh, I heard a lot of Haitians saying the past week, poor us so far from God, so close to the United States. <laughs> You know, the Haitians don't want to be the backyard of the U.S. Mm -hmm. And the slogan of Famille Lavalas, that was the party any Haitian watchers, supporters will remember Lavalas. Lavalas has gone through, I'd say, at least a generation, if not two generations of stiff repression. But Lavalas, which means flood in English, um, this was a massive popular uh, uh, movement. And what they're demanding is sali public, a public exit, a, a unified mm -hmm. uh, a public solution. And what that means is bringing in all the popular sectors. So uh, Haitian women have their democratic representation. The ghettos of Haiti have their democratic representation. The voodooisan, the practitioners of spirituality, they have their representation. And all the way down the line, the peasants and, and, and the ghettos and to bring all of them together, they all have different votes and, and, and they're the ones who can then say, we're going to appoint this commission and we're going to decide on a prime minister and we're going to have regional representation. But of course, the U.S. will never allow that. Yeah. And what the, the formulation of the Haitian people, if, if everyone remembers Jean-Claude Duvalier, Francois Duvalier, Baby Doc and Papa <laughs> Doc. Um, <laughs> through the 60s and 70s, 50s, 60s, 70s, all the way to 86, the Cold War, which is really a global class struggle, the anti-communism of the Duvaliers is why the U.S. gets behind them and they rule through the Tonton Makuts. And what the people of Haiti are saying today is that these paramilitaries, these mercenaries, are the Tonton Makuts of the 21st century. They're doing the same exact thing. <sighs> but I would actually say worse, because in the times of the Tonton Makuts, Every leftist was murdered. Every popular leader was assassinated. Every political prisoner. Um, how many Haitians had to go into uh, exile in the, in, in the 60s and 70s until the popular uprising called the Deshukaj. Deshukaj would mean overthrowing everything, 1986. And that's when you have the, 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 the formation of the Lavalas movement. So every U.S. action has to be analyzed within this context of the need of, of U.S. colonial power to make sure that there is no popular option, there is no true participatory democracy. <clears throat> but why is Haiti so important and always has been to the U.S.? What I mean, I've, I've actually heard speculation that there's oil under Haiti, but it's it's got to be more than that. And I feel like what makes Haiti so such a, a primary target? Mm. 
why was Grenada a country of I know hundred thousand students? Uh, that was students. so weird. People I don't know. 19, 1983, Ronald Reagan has this big invasion of Grenada. I was yeah. in Grenada two years ago. It, it, it you know, weird. in the Bronx, there's a hundred thousand people in one of the projects next to me. Um, but it's not, it's not weird. It's completely predictable. It's completely scientific. Imperialism dictates that no swath, no corner of the globe can be free. That's why Especially on this hemisphere. I did notice as soon as Biden took over that they seem to be kind of having this idea of putting down a great, another iron curtain between East and West for sure. And I feel like it was because the U S or the Western powers realized that they could they could not actually achieve world hegemony. They weren't going to actually be able to run the entire world. So might as well divide it back again. So at least you have total control over this half. And then they renewed their interest in the Western hemisphere. And I, and that's when like Kamala Harris and other people were talking about, they had their, um, you know, the organization of American states and they were there talking about how we have to like bank every last peasant and you know everybody, they just seem to take a renewed interest in totally dominating the Western hemisphere. I feel like that, that they, they focus. So you're right. It's not Haiti. It's not yeah. Grenada. It's, you know, I, the, was it Bolivia? Where is the guy who was chased out for the, cause of, he was going to build a lithium factory. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ecuador, yeah. you know, like Ecuador, they put the, that guy who's, I was like, this guy seems like an American puppet. He was born in Miami. <laughs> I was like, oh, whatever. I didn't even have to keep it. Guillermo Lasso. Yeah, yes. yeah. Pedro Castillo. Oh, you're right. It's everybody. Yeah, it's everybody. Pedro Castillo uh, suffered the coup in Peru about a year and a half ago. Yeah. Evo Morales in 2019. The OAS put the rubber stamp on it. So it's it's very consistent with U.S. Right. Uh, foreign policy. So you asked Monica about the uses of Haiti. Why is Haiti important yeah. economically? Certainly, there's 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 many resources across Haiti. I mean, Haiti has lush green uh, mounds. There has been incredible, you know, centuries of deforestation. Incredible uh, deforestation. The legacy of French colonialism. The legacy of the U.S. Marines occupation from 1915 to 1934. But Haiti has gold. Haiti has iridium. Haiti has uh, natural gas reserves. So there's definitely wealth. There's the sweatshops of Haiti. The Clintons yeah. have a sweatshop in the north. Um, for years, all U.S. baseballs were made in Haiti while Disney World produced so much of its goods. So there's the economic uses of Haiti. Humans. The <laughs> diplomatic uses of, of Haiti. They need Haiti's vote in the OAS. They need Haiti's vote against China. Uh, Haiti's one of the last countries that still recognizes Taiwan, doesn't recognize. Are those votes weighted by population? No, no, no. They're just okay. votes in general. There's right. diplomatic uses for Haiti Got it. As, as well. Um, there's, I, I would, I would go back to the colonial laboratory thesis, right? They want to try out this whole global oh, yes, stability yes. act. So now the U S yes, if definitely. the U S suspects that migration, yeah. so get ready for all the headlines. They're going to open up Guantanamo for the Haitians, just like oh in the 1980s and the early 1990s. Again, didn't Barack Obama say he was going to close down Guantanamo? <laughs> what happened? Monica? We don't talk about that. Yeah, no, we can't. Talk. <laughs> that was his first promise. You know, people were in the Bronx. It's people ridiculous. Were, people were shooting off the roof, celebrating. I was like, I'm telling y'all, ain't shit no. going to change. Mark no. my words. Yeah. Eight Cautiously, years later, were, in the immortal words of uh, Aaron Magruder. Of boondocks fame i'm cautiously pessimistic he said when obama was elected <laughs> um and then shortly after i was in western africa when obama came into office and of course you know obama has the kenyan you know his father was mm -hmm. kenyan so they were so excited in africa and i'm mm. like this is just this is just imperialism i think his father was mi6 actually Mm. I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a fact. So, so. it's important. Speaking of Kenya, the, the the so what the U.S. is trying to do because the idea of U.S. boots on the ground, the U.S. is three hundred <clears throat> billion dollars deep in this proxy war in Ukraine. The U.S. is now harassing Venezuela, trying to weaponize Guyanese nationalism. Um, you know, Nancy Pelosi and everyone else is egging on a war on China through Taiwan and, of course, the genocide in Gaza. So the U.S. foreign policy establishment didn't feel like they were capable of carrying out another occupation of, 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 of Haiti. So what the U.S. is trying to do 
similar to colonizers uh, past, the U.S. will give the $333 million to the Kenyan government, to William Ruto, a neoliberal stooge. But the Kenyan parliament and, 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 and the Kenyan legislation has said no so many times, so they can't push it through Kenya. So they're trying to use Benin. They're trying to use Chad. They're trying to use the Bahamas. They're trying to use Guyana. They're trying to use Jamaica. They're trying to use any country that will accept the U.S. funds and they'll be the boots on the ground, the cannon fodder to ca carry out what will be the fourth intervention, invasion, and occupation of Haiti in 100 years. So everyone should be prepared for all of yeah. the headlines. Understood. Now you can have your, your critical anti-imperialist media literacy ready because all of the headlines, like today, are going to tell you. So the new thing is yeah. if the U.S. suspects that this migration could destabilize the U.S. or another country or an ally, that's going to justify the U.S. then invading a country. Right. Think how quick they could use that against Venezuela after how many years of an economic war on Venezuela, another topic that I researched. Uh, I mean, it feels like the dominoes are just being set up all over the place. I did a show today about they're totally setting up for U.S. boots on the ground in Gaza. I worry about what they're planning for Yemen. Macron said that he wanted NATO boots on the ground in Ukraine. You see this stuff in Haiti. I mean, I, they're talking about getting, you know, literally <clears throat> actual invasions. <clears throat> it It is, I hope, I hope they're, I hope these are just scare tactics because it would be impossible to fight war on that many fronts, especially invasions. They and they are imperialistic invasions. Oof. I don't, I, you know, it's very scary. And I actually read a read a um, Paul Johnson's a famous like mainstream historian, and I was reading something he wrote years ago. It's like he he was kind of trying to puzzle through why when the the opinion a population, a foreign population has of America is inversely correlated by how much aid America gives that country. And he's like, people are just, people just resent being charity cases. And I'm like, it's not that people resent being charity cases. It's that American aid entered the country to take over its government and undermine the, the sovereignty of the people. That's why and that they know it. I mean, even... Well, whatever, we could go on and on about everything, but I don't want to keep you because I know that you have been on round the clock. So I want to talk about this um, Help Us Save Solino Haiti. It's a GoFundMe that you have established. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, and, and just on the point you were just making, there's this uh, maximum in Latin America, um, he who lends commands, he who borrows obeys. So all of these World Bank and IMF oh, yeah. structures, and it, that's how they get these countries into, Awful. just like us with a credit card uh, debt or student loan debt. And then they and have national debt. And who knows who, who's going to come calling for that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, we have 30 yeah. something trillion dollars of. My goodness. So we um, shall see. And, and, and that's why they have so much. Uh, that's why they have just absolute hatred and aggression towards yeah. China. Because so many of those bonds are owned yeah. by the Chinese. Yeah. Can you ever picture the U.S. bigwigs, the oligarchs, like yeah. going to the Chinese? Here's the money we uh, owe you. No, yes. it's, kind of it's never. Away. It's not resolving in this paradigm. But I do worry also about when we commit like physical war or economic war on these countries and drive them into poverty and homelessness Migration. and refugee. So then they migrate to your country instead of the way like when my grandparents came over a hundred years ago. They wanted a better life. They were willing to walk away from their culture to get it. And they embraced our like consumer producer culture here. And if they couldn't, they went back. Like there weren't even, none of my parents went through any kind of, they just went through a health screening. They didn't have to apply for any kind of green card or whatever. And one of my, or the great grandparents, whatever, went back to Syria. And uh, what happens, though, the reason, you know, just exacerbates the immigration conflict because what you've done, you 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 welcome the refugees after you've destroyed their country and they're pissed at you. So no wonder we've got, you know, ill will. People don't it doesn't work anymore because of, you know, in part because of that. And I think that's part of the plan too, just conflict. Just they yeah, like conflict. <laughs> yeah, no, no question. So Solino, Solino is one of the ghettos of Port-au-Prince. It's one of the biggest communities uh, of more than a hundred thousand people. 
they're under constant attack from these paramilitaries armed with U.S. guns. The way the Haitians explain it is that there are the gangsters up top with the suits and ties who are in D.C., who are in Miami. They coordinate with the Haitian uh, oligarchs, but then they give all the guns to the gangsters who have on flip-flops, just translating from, from Creole, mm -hmm. right? And then those are the enforcers in the ghetto. A lot of these gangsters mm -hmm. with flip-flops, the everyday gangsters, they're 18-year-old kids who don't have enough to eat, and they're holding a $5,000 yeah. automatic wow. Israeli Galil or, or, or an M16. You know, it's 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 ridiculous. Um, just a few more images uh, uh, to close out. Um, this, the, the, the gasoline uh, in, in Haiti right now, the gasoline when I was there, was it 15 uh, U.S. dollars last year? Is it 20 U.S. dollars for one gallon? So you have these massive, massive uh, lines. Um, there's a transportation uh, 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 crisis. This is one of the leaders uh, over there, Islanda, um, different uh, uh, solidarity events and, 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 and conferences. Um, this is this was one of my last days in Haiti, but they built these. Uh, this is another barricade. They have to build these massive uh, barricades. And we, the, the Haitian people, need all the solidarity that they can get. Um, this is a people to people fundraiser. Uh, this was an event we did in solidarity with Palestine. The Haitians identify often as the Palestine of the Caribbean, of the most forgotten. So people can go here, check out Molegaf, help us save. So, you know, this was a report that I did comparing Gaza uh, to Port-au-Prince. And here it is. This is the community. So, you know, this is Jean Renal. This is Ezai. These are leaders there uh, in, in the community. I explain why the death squads are attacking. Here is T. Jojo, Joji, Luko. So these are the, um, you know, these are the people on the ground um, struggling and in, 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 in fighting. And they just ask for our comprehension and human compassion and solidarity so and what you raised help, say that again sorry no anybody who can uh, help we, we've raised some six thousand right now because every night they do um they collect funds so they can pay uh different volunteers who have to man the barricades because if they're right. attacked in the middle of the night mm -hmm. it's like a whole it's like the spanish civil war or the mm -hmm. soviet union resisting the nazis the whole neighborhood is 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 organized and mobilized right. to resist that's when you know you have a just war when you're actually defending your own property <laughs> you know like we're always told that we have to go to war we have to send guns we have to send soldiers i mean and our the, our boots on the ground is somebody else's ground always. So, you know, you know, when it's how your ground. Our, <laughs> how, did, how did our oil get under that? Yes, I know it's sand? outrageous. I've been trying to figure it out for so many years. <laughs> I know. I do wonder about that with Haiti, if they have even some oil under there. Well, that's fantastic. And how can you tell people a little bit about your work and how they can follow you or read some of your books? And actually you also do uh, a lot of work on nutrition and health and, um, that kind of thing, which is probably good for your soul <laughs> to get out <laughs> yeah, of. Yeah, I have a book out on life foods, nutrition, and raw foods, and vegetarianism. And for me, as I got older as a boxer, that, that transition is called shedding that which is not us. But I will show you my um, latest uh, uh, book here. Um, here it comes. So I put out this book uh, about two weeks ago. This is Genocide, 48 Poems for Gaza, uh, documenting what I've been watching, what the world has been watching uh, really since October 7th. And the children of the craters, I talk a lot about these massive craters that exi have existed in Gaza way before uh, October 7th. And the craters from the Israeli and US bombs and the children grow up around these craters it looks like the surface of, of the moon. So people can check out that book in solidarity with Palestine. Interesting. Well, thank you so much, Professor Danny Shaw. You have such an interesting resume and you do such fascinating work, really learn, knowing those languages, that you know the languages of the people really gives you a unique perspective into how they feel and what they're going through. And it's just, it really, we have no other access to that side of things than people who really get on the ground on it. No pasta does it as well. So I thank him for introducing us to you. And thanks so much. That was so fascinating. Thank you all for listening. This is Monica Perez.